The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. And welcome once again, folks, to another edition of Wrestling Unwrapped here on the W2M Network. I am your host, the absolutely toasted Patrick Kessa, and no, I don't mean hi. And joining me, as always, the, well, usually actually toasted, Harry Broadhurst. How are you? Very funny comment to make to the straight edge guy. So cute. I tried. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> as we wrapped up August of 1998 in our previous edition, we have decided to switch gears. Kind of. Namely, well, we're bringing back WCW rules, so we're not exactly switching gears. Why? Because we have decided on a show that can get me into a hell of a lot of trouble, as we will be doing Rise 1 Ignite from this past November at the world-famous Berwyn Eagles Club. All 14 matches of Rise 1 Ignite. Yeah, never let it be said that we take the easy way out on these shows. There's no shortcut home. No? I, I blame you. That's all I'm saying. I gave you a chip shot there. Anyway. I, so I, before, I actually didn't catch it, so I'm going to let you off with a warning this time, and we'll move on. There's no show. Forget it. Anyway, as always, before we get started, we should mention that this is a presentation of the W2N Network. For more information, including our previous episodes, most recently our August 1998 episodes of ECW Heatwave, WCW Road Wild, and WWF SummerSlam, be sure to check out W2Nnet.com. As well, you can also find us on both LastWordOnSports.com and 411. One, one, mania.com. Hey, Patrick, you know what else they can find if they go to w2mnet.com? Uh, I'm afraid to ask because I know the answer. We have a written review up. Oh, my God. Wait, sir. Ah! <laughs> Indeed, our written review of PWG 3, Mendes, has finally made it to w2mnet.com so you can see even more of our opinions from our ROH? No! From PWG's third anniversary show headlined by that cage match. And opened by the guy you just sounded like there, Excalibur. <laughs> In a really weird opener. Yeah, well, it happened um. Yeah. November November tenth, correct? Yes. Okay. I'm ready when you oh. are. Eleven ten sixteen from the world famous Madison Eagles Club in Berwyn. Oh wait, it's Rise, not Shimmer. Never mind. As we always do, here's Harry with the results. Yes, it is the world famous Madison Berwyn Eagles Club in Berwyn. Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, the home Chicago, at least in Mr. Ketza. And these are your results for Rise Volume 1, Ignite. Our opening contest sees Sonya Strong pin Liza Hall at 7 minutes and 22 seconds with a flying chuck kick. I suppose the the technically more accurate way to phrase that would be Gam and Geary, but eh, whatever. Ariana and Eve go to a no contest at 4 minutes and 25 seconds, courtesy of Jessica Carr. Oh, wait, you nope. Don't know her. Well, okay, I'll give you that one. 
Okay, you, you wouldn't know her as that here. Technically speaking, at this point, she was still Kennedy Brink. WWE fans will know her as NYC referee Jessica Carr. Brittany Baker and skilled death artist number one co-win a battle royal to get a singles match a little later on in the show to determine the qual- last qualifier for the F- FROP or F-E-O-R. F-E-0-R. <laughs> what? It's, it's an O, not a zero. It's um. Zero. No. On the case, it's zero. Oh, God, we're going to start this already. Anyway, Britt Baker and go, skill, skill death real, artist number one. Real quick, go with a zero. We'll talk about that later. Trust me, we will. Whatever. Anyway, um, skill death artist number one then unmasks to reveal, shockingly, a ninja, a Canadian ninja, the not-retired one, that being Nicole Matthews. Ooh. Yeah, I miss Porsche as much as the next person, but... Porsche doesn't wrestle anymore. It is what it is. I know. Anyway. Angel Dust pins Aria Blake at five minutes and six seconds with a backstabber in another qualifying match. Six-woman tag team action sees C-Bunny, Antoinette Marie, and Sierra defeat the team of Stacey Shadows, Sunset Rivera, and Helen Vale at 4 minutes and 53 seconds. You'll notice a lot of patterns here. There's like two matches on this entire show that go 10 minutes. Delilah Doom pins Samantha Heights at 7 minutes and 30 seconds in another qualifying match with the Maya Via Hurricane. If Delilah has a name for it, I do not know it. Neither do I. We get a repeat performer here on this show for us. We just recently covered an Angie Sky match over on uh, Atomic Championship Wrestling. Well, she's back here and defeating Tess Valentine at 6 minutes and 40 seconds with the hard goodbye, her variation of the unprettier. Kate Carney defeats Heather Monroe in another qualifying match with a loaded right hand at 5 minutes and 33 seconds. The following murder is scheduled for two falls in a three-way elimination match. <laughs> Shayna right. Baszler retains, is Shayna Baszler retains the AIW Absolute Women's title, tapping Raylan and Azalee. Azalee? Sure. Irrelevant. Yeah. At six. It's 6.34 and 6.38, respectively. I know they said it was a double submission. Ray Lynn tapped first. Shotzi Blackheart pins Savannah Evans with a cannonball at 5 minutes and 36 seconds. Okay, so now this one's kind of difficult to time out because technically I didn't start the timer until they got in the ring. Therefore, Mum... The Ray and Knight defeat Kennedy Brink, Jessica Carr, at 19 seconds with a rocking horse submission. The match was not 19 seconds. Don't worry. We'll talk about it when we get there, folks. We promise. Britt Baker defeats Nicole Matthews by reverse decision in seven minutes and two seconds in the final F-E-0-R whatever, qualifying match. I'm going to screw this up. Ikyo? Yes. Cool. And Ronnie Nicole defeat Ashley Vox and Delmi Exo at 14 minutes and 8 seconds when Ronnie Nicole pins Ashley Vox. Just, just wait for this one, folks. It's worth the wait, I promise. And your main event sees Angel Dust win a four-way, one-fall-to-a-finish match, become the first ever first, well, I guess first ever first finish match. Nicely done. To become the Phoenix of Rise champion 
pinning Kate Carney with a rope trap backstabber at 4 minutes and 47 seconds. That's a lot of freaking matches. Indeed. Mm, word. Thank you, Harry. What I do. Yes, it is. All right. 14 matches. I think in terms of single shows, this is either the most or tied for the most that we'll ever cover. I'm trying to remember how many Spring Stampede had. Spring Stampede was 12, I believe. Great. Don't worry, though, folks. Less swearing this time. We think. Uh, I make no such promise. <laughs> I do. I won't, I'll try not to swear that much. That much. No, no, how about this? I promise no big boy cuss words. How's that? Okay, that works. All right. So, indeed... You are looking at a company that wants to develop tomorrow's women athletes. You don't even want to know what the original tagline was, but it spelled out a bad word accidentally. Making their debut another debut for us. This is Rise One Ignite. Who's got the stopwatch? Me? <laughs> um... Hold on, I don't have a stopwatch ready because I wasn't aware we were doing WCW rules. That was never finalized. All right, never mind then. Don't worry about it. I, th- I think we can hammer through this. Well, I mean, I can get a stopwatch ready to go within a couple of moments and you just have to bear with me. Go ahead and start the show. <laughs> Indeed. So, kicking things off, this is actually technically the pre-show. The first two matches are technically the pre-show, though you couldn't actually tell. Um, so the <clears throat> last chance rumble was actually the first match. Figure that one out. But our first match here, yes. I said it was the first match because region. Yep. You good to go? Uh, all right, hit it. All right. So Sonia Strong versus Liza Hall. Ready. Set, go. <laughs> Not a good start. <laughs> Not ready. To the show or this show. <laughs> um, actually, I disagree with that. I was kind of impressed by Sonya Strong. I mean, Liza Hall did nothing for me. She came off as generic heel number 63. But Sonya Strong actually has an intriguing look. She has a relatively solid move set, and she's an interesting character. Plus... She was one of the better looking um, in terms of ring gear competitors on the show as well. I do have to agree with that. I think she actually had the look and everything kind of down pat because this is a, a, a show that's relatively to try and you know bring in new wrestlers and kind of teach them the ways, um, the ways of the ring and, and that kind of thing. Um, Sonya Strong did seem relatively set though, you know. Probably not the best person to put her up against, though. No, there was a lot of very generic gear on the show, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to get into specifics. There's a couple of people I'm going to call out in particular, but we'll get to them when their matches arrive. But um, back, to, uh, back to this match here. Yeah, I came out of this match impressed by Sonya Strong. As I said, Liza Hall did nothing for me. I, I thought she was just kind of there. Sonya probably would have worked better against one of the bigger names that ended up showing up on the show. Because it was pretty clear, too, that Sonya had a following there in attendance at the Berlin Eagles Club as well. Sure. Well, you were there live. I know. <laughs> so I I'll say again. Confused. Sure. Airhorn guy seemed to love her. Oh, shut up. <laughs> and, and as far as the reception, what reception? There was nobody there. No, it was definitely very sparsely attended. I did notice that as well. Oh, well, well we're, we're going to get into that later on, but not right here. So, uh, so, 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 so you're strong as I'm picking up the win, and I'd say we're done. Minute and 29 seconds. Well, if we can just do that 13 more times. <laughs> we'll be out of here in 15 minutes. I don't think that ends well for anybody. 
Our next contest, Ariana versus the Black Widow Eve. Ready? Uh-huh. Go. <laughs> the main okay, so... Oh, no, I'm, go ahead. I'm going, go ahead. I'm going first here. Um, all right, who thought it was a good idea for Eve to, wait, to raid Calamity's wardrobe? Thank you. Because that is the only thought I had throughout this entirety, entire match. Is why does Eve look like she raided Calamity's closet? I thank you for that one because, well, I'll take any excuse to talk about Calamity, but, yeah, this, this was really bad. Like, this was a – she looked just like her. I mean, all things considered, the match was okay for what it was. There's not really a whole lot you're going to get done with four and a half minutes. And then it doesn't help that the entire point of the match wasn't the match itself. The entire point of the match was the uh, interference of Kennedy Brink essentially to set up one of the future matches for later in the night. Um, And the match ends up getting thrown out. The match itself, I didn't think was that bad, but... It wasn't exactly great. Nothing, you know, eye-popping or chart-topping here. Um, but the bigger focus, obviously, was Kennedy Brink to set up her match against Soraya Knight later in the night when Soraya pretty much just attempts to go to town on every referee and every piece of security that was out there, all <clears throat> five of them, which isn't enough. Okay, to be fair, that's like every Soraya Knight show ever. Not lately. Mm. More often than people would like to admit, possibly. Yeah, um, yeah this match was just an end to a means here, so there's really not a whole lot to say about it. What was there was competent, but not necessarily entertaining. Yeah, I'm good. So, I'm good. One, 150. I hope you're writing these down. Uh, one more time. What was the first one? You cut out there. Try that again. What was the first one? Oh, uh, 130-ish. I started the clock a little late, so I put 135. 135, 150. Okay. The next one. one. I know. The first one on the actual main show. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Ready? Go. I'm starting. How is a last chance rumble the first match on the show? If I'm thinking last chance, I'm thinking like every other winner from the previous matches and possibly the FP0R losers and throwing them into a rumble to try and kill some time before the main event. I'm not going to do this as the first match. Yeah, I questioned the point of the... But I think it was because they did a series of contests to determine who got the singles matches on the show. No. So my assumption, my assumption is that, like, because they had, like, the My Dream Match contest before the Delilah Doom and, uh, like, why am I drawing a blank already? Samantha Heights. Samantha Heights match. Um, Angel Dust was looked at as kind of the veteran coming into this. Or, I mean, she no, is. Fake Karn, or, no, uh, Delilah Doom won the, uh, won the fan voting contest thing. Uh, Kate Carney and... Heather Monroe were the ones that had the My Dream Match thing. So I apologize for that, but... Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, regardless of that point, though, back to this particular match here. Um, Drawing a blank? That was a raspberry, and that's the rating I give this match. One gigantic oh. raspberry. I mean, yeah, this was essentially a get-everybody-else-on-the-show match. You know, the uh, Andre the Giant Battle Royal kind of thing. And the fact that out of that we actually end up having another match doesn't really help because this pretty much means, you know, once we now know that it's an FP0 or qualifier, qualifier, that means uh, still death artist number one, and Britt Baker, one of them's going to have to wrestle three times. We'd find out that it would be Britt Baker. Um, Nicole Matthews got one of the lar- one of the biggest reactions of the night when she unmasked. That's not good. 
I'm trying to find a list of participants here, and I'm not really getting very far. Okay, here we go. Um, bear with me as I figure this out, people. I apologize. Hurry. All right. Um, Jocelyn. Yeah, they don't actually have them listed. It's just the, the single match participants and stuff. I don't see a listing for the people that win this match. Honestly, Britt Baker is about the only one that I'm actually familiar with. I mean, obviously, Nicole Matthews, but that doesn't count here. This is supposed to be a developmental deal. I've heard of Faye Jackson. I was not impressed because apparently she thinks she's with Tishi. I know Paloma Starr from Chicago. She was the last person eliminated. Um, oh, I never. But. Up until today, I had up until when I watched this show. I think I watched it Friday night. I had never heard of the Sriracha Muchacha. Of who? Oh, the Sriracha Muchacha. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of people who impressed me. I was really impressed by the Derby girl that started it. Actually, trying to remember her name. Bear with me, folks. There's 47 wrestlers on this card. I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I, I cannot think of her name. It's a, I'll look it up. I'll look it okay. up while we're continuing on, and we'll come back to it. But anyways, okay. no, the battle... This battle royal was just awful. Yeah, it's not great, and it just, it, it pretty much starts the confusion of the night, which, that's why I said keep going with FB0R, because we'll get to that. So, I'm good. Yeah, I don't have anything to add here other than finding out this girl's name, because she was really the only one in the match that impressed me, so... I'm looking up a list of participants for everybody. I'll get that to you guys once I find it. But oh, you too? Here. Huh? You too? Yeah, I'm trying to find a list. But, but for now, we'll, we'll pull the trigger on this match here and call it at 428. So, our following, our next contest is yet another FP0R match. This time it is Angel Dust versus Aria Blake. You ready to go? Yes. Angel Dust versus right. Aria Blake. That is correct. Oh, what was the time for the battle for the rumble? I literally just said four minutes and 28 seconds. I did not hear that. Sorry. But you should be, frankly. I don't know. Off. All right. Ready? No. Go. No? No. Okay. Not no. ready. Just trying to no. get the cage match to look for the participants. All right, go ahead. Ready when you are. Three, two, one. Go. Um, I'm excusing this might myself. Actually be one of the... Go ahead. I'm excusing myself from discussing this match. I'm actually... I'm co-workers with one of the participants, and I do not feel that I could be unbiased, so therefore I am not going to discuss this call. Well, I still am unbiased, and I didn't think it was that bad of a match, honestly. It was one of the better ones on the show. That's kind of saying oh, no, the, the match was fine. I didn't have any issues with it. One of the big things that you're going to notice throughout the course of the show, though, is the significant lack of time that most of these matches get. Um, it's, it's eventually revealed the FP zero R thing or whatever, but it started on this. Yeah, it is involved there, but yes, the FP zero R mm-hmm. thing in, involved here. They eventually reveal that it's for the first title. Well, you would think that your qualifiers to determine your first champion would be a little bit longer than five minutes. So. Yeah, unfortunately, we're at a we're at a point where it's fourteen matches on a show that's under three hours. Not even like two and a DVD half hours. Is, yeah, the DVD, I think for me, was 218. Think 218 about that. 128 20. minutes. Yeah. Um, I mean, this was definitely one of the better matches, and I think Angel Dust actually had one of the better showings of the entire night. Um, it would be worthy of being in the main event, although that main event... Yeah. Anyway. Um, Aria... I didn't really see too much that was kind of spectacular to where she might be in line for the uh, FP0R. I think definitely the right person won here, and 
It's, it's almost hard to believe that Angel Dust is actually one of the most tenured wrestlers on this entire card, which is not something that you really think of when you think of Angel Dust. You think of, you know, her being kind of, I don't want to say middle of the road, but in terms of tenure as a wrestler, but she's actually one of the longest ones here in the room. If I'm not mistaken, of the people that were actually specifically focused to live, she is the longest tenured of everybody that is involved Mom. in the show. Mom? Uh, not specifically tenured, so she's coming from Shimmer. She's, oh, a former, okay. she's a former Shimmer heavyweight champion. Angel Dust has yet, had yet to break out into Shimmer. She would get her debut with Shimmer as a result of this show, but she had yet to debut for Shimmer, at least on okay. the main card, to my knowledge. All right, fair point. So Angel Dust does end up picking up the victory. Um, good. There. Ready? Mm-hmm. Oh, we're done with this match? I'm done. Okay. 302. Wow, it took a while. Alrighty. So it's the next contest is actually one of only two tag team matches, somehow. Team, well, actually, it's Team Bruce City versus Team East Coast originally. It's supposed to be Sea Bunny, Antoinette Marie, and Helen Vale versus Stacey Shadow, Sunset Riviera, and Sierra. How about we say go now? Timer has been started. Carry on. Oh. What the hell? First, I don't know that I've ever actually seen a match where you had a talent trade. In that, I believe it was Helen Vale and Sierra that switched teams? It was. I've actually seen it happen before. Um, I remember a IWA Mid-South, uh, Ted Petty Invitational show, where tag team partners were traded. And then the tag team partner that was traded ended up scoring the pinfall over the other person that was traded, much the same way it was here. Which is a decent enough idea. Um... I didn't find anything good here, especially Sea Bunny's dancing. You leave Sea Bunny alone. At least she was trying to get the crowd involved, which is more than I can say about the other five. Unfortunately, I know one of them. I've seen them before. I won't name names, but I have gone on the record as saying that they once had... So, for those that don't know, before Shimmer, the pre-show matches used to be called Sparkle. I once said that this wrestler had a Sparkle match that was so bad that they canceled Sparkle for two years. I won't name the name, but she was in this match, and, yeah, she didn't get any better. Can can I name Um, the name? Can I name the name? Because I'm about to tell you who I strongly disliked in this match. Well, let's see if it's the same person. Um, So I came out kind of indifferent on most of these women. But there was one person who did stand out for this match for me, but she stood out for all of the wrong reasons. Uh, I, would offic- I would officially like to present the Anna Manushka Award for this particular oh show to State oh of Shadows. That woman I, was I, a hot mess in this match. I will neither confirm nor deny that she was said Sparkle Wrestler. By which you mean you will confirm to me off air. I will neither confirm nor deny. On air. Off air is a different story, folks. Speaking of the match... Go ahead. I already did. I said I was indifferent towards everybody except for Stacey Shadows, who did not impress me in the slightest. Yeah, this match was kind of a, a cluster and a half. Um, I mean, you could see that you know some of them were trying to get the crowd into it, but at the same time, I think by this point the crowd was kind of eh, and were essentially either A, getting drunk, or B, starting to look forward to the next day. Because we should mention... This was a Thursday, a Thursday night at the Eagles Club, and there's less than 90 there. 
or less than 100. I think it was 93. That's it. Which is yeah, if you incredible. If you sporadically pro- pause your DVD, you can probably count all of them. You know, I wouldn't be... Well, 90 later. You know, match 11, 12, 13, and 14. Um, this match just... Ugh, not good at all. So... I'm done. I th- I thought that C Bunny, Antoinette Marie, and Sierra had a good energy. I think they were the only things that were keeping the crowd in the because the crowd kind of did react to the dancing. So to be fair, there was a lot of freaking dancing on this show. Yeah, and a lot of booty shaking. I I, I want to be taken as seriously as a wrestler and not watch my ass jiggle. Really. No right. comments. Yeah. Moving on. 416. Second longest so far. Uh-huh. Our following contest is another FP0R qualifier. <clears throat> We're getting closer. Samantha Heights versus Delilah Doom. Ready? Uh-huh. Go. Why the hell is Samantha Heights heel? From that one, just say start the clock. Okay. Why the hell is Samantha Heights heel? I've never seen her once work as a bad guy. Ever. But at the same time, I can kind of understand why here, because Samantha Heights was wrestling as the Lost Girl, while Delilah Doom is Delilah Doom. I mean... It's like if, if if a case of highlighters exploded at a yoga studio or jazzercise studio. That's that's kind of how I would explain Delilah Doom. Del- Delilah Doom is Richard Simmons for the next generation. Nope. Richard Simmons for the next generation is Leva Bates per her most recent shimmer tapings. Oh, boy. Uh, actually, wasn't there somebody that actually had like a Richard Simmons? Who was? Was it Gabby Gabbard that had, or Gabby Gilbert? Huh? The former Roxy Cotton. Didn't she have a uh, like like a a, a, a jazzer side thing? I remember one in NGW. Yeah. Karen Brooks. Yes. That's why I couldn't. I think that was Pepe Cows, though. I, I remember. I remember the the, the whole uh, exerciser gimmick thing there. Uh, yeah, as you said, Delilah. Delilah Doom looks like a package of highlighter markers exploded onto ring gear. Honestly, after the last couple of matches, specifically being the Battle Royal and the Six Woman Tag, this actually wasn't too terrible to me. Yeah, this was kind of refreshing because you had two wrestlers that fully knew what they were doing. It's kind of sad. Um, I will, but I, I mean, I will. A little, 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 my turn. I will say that I was impressed by the. Uh, I will say that I was impressed by Delilah Doom's finish. I thought she was very. Uh, I thought she flowed very well with the DDT. I've seen people use that move before, and it's like complete and total garbage. But she actually hit it really clean. Very true. Um, and I mean, Samantha Height, you know, for, for still for being a relative newcomer, maybe one of the fastest that's picking it up. So you know, she's definitely got a hell of a future. Um, the more I've seen of her, especially like at AAW, she's just gotten better and better. So um, maybe not her best match thus far, but by no means a bad match. And honestly, it's a godsend on this show. Um, so, and Delilah Doom ends up picking up the win. So she once again qualifies for the FP0R. I'm good. Minutes and 48 seconds. How many? 248. Thank you. I didn't hear the two. I was listening, but you cut out. I can't help the next one. Horrible. Yeah. Our next one. Oh, boy. Angie Sky versus Tess Valentine. Start the clock. I'm going first here. Um, You know, we were actually talking about this match by text message while you were watching it. I watched the show a little bit before you did. And you sent me a message that said, well, this match was going good. Uh, I'm actually going to disagree with that. The reason I say that is because I actually think they really re- recovered very well from the botch. 
And for those of you that aren't aware of what I'm referring to, there's a spot in this particular match where Tess Valentine goes for what looks like the old Molly Holly springboard back elbow thing, the uh, cartwheel roundhouse backflip elbow. The, the way I've always heard it is the way Rob Van Dam used to call it, the Jushin Thunder Chick move. Well, she goes for the old Marley Harley uh, back, foot, back elbow in the corner there, and she trips on the ropes. But I think the cool thing about this is that they actually manage to recover quite nicely from that, and they get into the uh, they get back into the flow of the match without really giving up too much. Well, all I had said was, well, it was going well until that happened. I didn't... It, <laughs> that was bad. Like, that was really bad. That's I mean, probably one of the worst botches of that move I've ever seen. But, okay, but to, but, to, be, to be but, fair, okay, you can speak in a second here. To be fair, that's not exactly an easy move to pull off. It requires a lot of athleticism. I mean, and she had it. She just didn't have the, I guess, ring aware. Well, ring positioning. Yeah, she didn't have the ring positioning for it. But that, com- that comes with age. Go ahead. But, yes, they did recover well, very well, actually. Um, I, I think Angie Sky picking up the win, I mean, there really wasn't anything to be won or lost here. The only thing that did, I believe, end up happening was Angie Sky, I think, actually did end up on one volume that weekend. Um, because... Uh, once again, like I said, this was on Thursday, and Shiver was running Friday night, two shows Saturday, and two shows Sunday. So, yeah, this was a packed schedule. I believe Angie Sky did end up on one of the shows, but I can't remember which one. Um, aside from that, Bosch, not terrible, not the you know, world's greatest, but this, this was kind of, this. you could almost make the argument this was on the better side. Yeah, if we were to actually rate these matches, and we're going to eventually have to do that once we do the written review, show, uh, I think that you'll find. I think that you'll find that the actual ratings are going to end up coming up. Uh, the actual ratings for this match, this will probably end up in the higher side of the uh, of the contest that you see on the evening. By the way, the Derby girl whose name we could not remember was Lane Rosario. Ah. I'm good. Yeah, I'm square. All right. Three fourteen. Three fourteen. Bye. All righty. So, another FP zero R match. Our one, two, three, fourth of the night. Technically, remember we had the FP zero R qualifier. Qualifier. So. Kate Carney versus Heather Monroe. Start the clock. This is one that I'm having the most trouble remembering just because I don't remember anything from it outside of Kate Carney having her own pyro, essentially. Oh, it's one of those uh, one of those Fourth of July streamer shooter things, and it ends up yeah. coming into play in the finish. Um, I like. I actually kind of enjoyed the Kate Carney thing here. Um, you know what I kind of got a vibe of here? And I'm not going to say she's anywhere near this level because she's not. But I got kind of like a Trish vibe from her. <laughs> An attractive woman who's not afraid to be evil. She bides Did her time. And then she, she bid her time and then she struck when the opportunity presented itself to get one over on both Heather Monroe and the opportunity to go into the main event. Frankly, I thought it was smart booking. Yeah, this this wasn't that bad. I just, there's like no distinguishing things. By the way, what the hell is Kate Carney wearing? It looks like a bandolier of glitter. I'm not um, kidding. It, it looks like a I, bandolier of glitter. I mean, out of out of all the women, uh, I thought that Carney had some of the best gear on the show. So, looking like Cleopatra. Yes. 
And once we found out what her character was all about towards the end of the match, the gear made even more sense that she would try to emulate the Egyptian queen if she wants to use the Cleopatra for reference. I suppose. But it's... Okay, real quick, I should mention, this is legitimately the only time I've ever seen anything from Kate Carney. I've never heard of her before this. I have never seen anything of her since. So, yeah. No, she's more or less disappeared. I haven't heard anything. To my knowledge, she only does, like, the, uh, the whatchamacallit shoots, the, uh, the fetish shoots now, the, um, the, custom, the custom videotapes. Because I don't really see her name out there as far as any wrestling shows go. I Googled her, and yeah. I didn't really find anything. Yeah. Well, once again, with something like that, I will refrain from commenting only because I know people that do those. Okay, sure is what it is. Anything for Heather Monroe? Nothing. Same thing. I've not heard of her before or since. Um, she was there, I guess would be the best thing I could say. Just like the ring announcer. Uh, no, I have something to say about that ring announcer, but that's neither here nor there. I'm good. All right, we're done here? 254. All right, before we bring up the next contest, so get through a couple factoids here. One, this was the debut of that ring announcer. It wasn't great. Uh, two, your commentary team. Actually, do you know who the commentary team was? Um, yeah, Vita Scott and uh, Marty DeRosa. Ah, very good. Indeed, Vita Scott and Marty DeRosa. Unlike Shimmer, one commentary team for the entire show. I was actually quite pleased with that. Um, it could have been better, but we'll talk about that later. We're going to talk about everything later, apparently. Well, um, I- I'm going to express my disapproval of one thing later. But the, the commentary is a definite talking point for me, and, I'm, and I think you kind of know where I'm going with that because I sent you a text about it. Yeah. So, all right, now that those are out of the way, the intermission is now over, at least in our show. So Man, our next an, an, an indie show intermission lasting less than 15 minutes. I don't know how that's going to go over. Oh, no, 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 no. This show didn't have an intermission, but... And we're not an indie show. Uh, tonight we are. <laughs> I hate you. Uh, but I'm not wrong. All right, let's get to this three-way. All right. A three-way uh, game for the AIW Women's Championship. Ray Lynn faces the Duchess Izali. Azali. Azali. Versus the champion... You might know her from the Mae Young Classic, you know, the Queen of Spades, Shayna Baszler, accompanied to the ring for about 30 seconds by Ish. the then Heart of Shimmer champion, Nicole Savoy, and then and current Shimmer champion, Mercedes Martinez. <laughs> Not that there's any point, start the clock. This was a murder and an exhibition squash. <laughs> Yeah, I think this was there so that way they could see what kind of beating these two girls could see, take in order to determine their viability for usage in Shimmer down the road. Or at AIW in the future, because if I'm not mistaken, Ray Lynn does work at AIW. If I am not mistaken, you are correct about that. I mean, I'm more local to AIW than you are, but I can't say I'm up to date with the current product. So I think she's in like some group with like Gregory Iron and a few others. So, um, yeah, the kind of weird thing is is that 45 seconds, give or take, is how long Mercedes and Savoy are there before they're thrown out. And that's not easy. They're they're around ringside for a couple of minutes. Because Mercedes ends up pitching uh, Azalee and Ray Lynn back into the ring a couple of times before Nicole Savoy gets caught choking Azalee. Ah, okay. And then they're thrown out. 
But by the way, in terms of being at ringside for a few minutes, yeah, everybody on the show was either at ringside or in the ring for a few minutes. Yeah, that's 100% accurate. Like I said earlier when we were running down the results, uh, there are only two matches on the show that cracked 10 minutes. Yeah. So, and I'm just for argument's sake going to say that it's a double tap out, even though you are 100% right. Raylid does tap out a few seconds before Azali. Azali, oh, forget it. Um, it's not worth but, remembering, honestly. No, it's not. Cause once again, much like others, this is the only time I've ever heard of her. As I previously mentioned when we did the uh, show pre- when we did the show results, and I cracked up Patrick with this, the following three-way murder is scheduled for two falls. Yes, it was elimination. Shayna eliminates both of them at roughly the same time. And with a that, three, a we move on. Quick, uh, Azeli, Azeli, screw it. Uh, via ankle lock, and I'm trying to remember what Raylan kept up to. Armbar? Um, hold on, I have it written down here. Uh, triangle choke. Right. She, she had, she had, uh, or Shayna had her trap in her legs while she had the ankle lock on. The first Shayna had, Shayna had, Shayna had Raylan tag, trapped in the triangle choke. Um, uh, Azeli tried a, uh, a chest kick in order to break it up. Baszler caught the chest kick and turned it into a shamrock-style ankle walk. And wins and retains her belt, which she, I believe, still currently holds. Alrighty. Three minutes and 12 seconds, which is about how long Mercedes and Safoy were at ringside. I was going to say, it's not much longer than the match. All righty. So, match number 10. Savannah Evans versus Shotzi Blackheart. Start the clock. Now, I'm going, I've seen Evans a few times. Obviously, I've seen Shotzi more than a few times. I didn't think this was that bad of a match. I didn't think Evans was actually that bad for being a relative unknown to the entire business. Shotzi obviously would uh, go on to become the second and current, uh, uh, we'll just get it out there, Phoenix of Rise champion, defeating Dust, Angel Dust, Rosemary, Salting Cracker, I don't know what that was she's calling herself now. Um, Did you really just call her Saltine Cracker? No. Um... But I didn't, you know, not a terrible match. Once again, one of the better ones on the entire show. Uh, Shotzi, I thought definitely, despite having kind of a weird finisher at this point, you know, a cannonball, kind of a more, more reserved for uh, bigger people. I was going to say, was gonna say more Rubenesque, but yes, you know, if, if, if I think cannonball, I'm thinking more along the lines of Jordan Grace, Isisto. One half of the second to last match of the show. Kevin Owens. You know, Kevin Owens. Well, I was going more female, but yes, Kevin Owens. So to have somebody who's relatively small win via the uh, cannonball was a little odd, but I'm okay with it. Uh, Savannah Evans, I haven't seen too much of her in the ring. I've honestly mostly seen her... Uh, doing work at, like, the WrestleCon shows during WrestleMania weekend. Um, I would like to see more of her, though. I don't really think she's that bad. Um, you know what it is? I think the thing that stood out about this match, too, is the fact that both of these women have very unique looks. Uh, Savannah Evans has almost kind of like this jungle cat look about her. Careful. No, I don't don't even assume that that's that's gaining that way because it's I know. not. Her ring gear comes off almost cheetah esque to me, and especially when you add in the face paint as well, or the face makeup or whatever it was. Um, honestly, the biggest the biggest surprise to me of this show was Shanti Blackheart. 
I had not previously seen her before. I had heard of her. Obviously, I knew she was the one that took the first piece of the Phoenix of Rise title off of Angel Dust. So I, I was kind of expecting... Well, I don't know what I was expecting, to be frankly honest with you. But she's got a very unique look about her. She's got almost like an Asian punk rocker gimmick, which is odd, but at the same time very interesting. And for being as relatively new to the business as she is, she's actually not bad in the ring. Do you follow comics at all? Say what now? Do you follow comics at all? Like comic books? No, I do not, but okay, I'm listening. Oh. She's Tank Girl. Just look it up later. She's Tank Girl. Oh, no. Never mind. I'll I'll ask you another question off air. All right. All right. We done here? Yep. 3.30. No, it's almost 9.30 here. All right, so I'm going to tell you right now we're not going to be able to enforce WCW rules for the following contest because bell to bell is 19 seconds. I mean, it's doable. It really is, and you know okay. it is. Okay, yeah, but then I'd have to use language that I really don't feel comfortable using on the air to describe it. So for the All three, right. I, I, for I, the think, I think I think we're ahead anyway. So for the for the following contest, we are going to waive WCW rules because most of this match happens before the actual match happens. It is Mum, Soraya Knight, and Kennedy Brink. Starts the clock. The ex the exclamation point, Kennedy Brink, which is kind of ironic because she got twisted around like an ampersand in this contest. Good God, man! What are you? <laughs> Do you hear yourself? I do. That was hilarious, and you know it. God. Anyway, um, yeah. Welcome to the Berwyn Eagles Club, Kennedy, even though you wrestled there before. Um, uh, <laughs> this match seems like a very graphic illustration in one thing. Do not piss the Ray and Knight off. I mean... Hell, if, if, if Kennedy needed that advice, I could have told her I'm the one that's been slapped and hit with a frappuccino from mom. She will kick you in the cooch repeatedly. <laughs> it's like the uh, the director when uh, from The Simpsons when uh, Milhouse has to do one of the scenes again just so they can get it from different angles is that she will kick you there again and again. And again, and again, and again. And again, and again, and again. Like, I'm not sure if that hurts women as much as it does men, but if it does hurt women as much as it does men, then I feel very, very sorry for Kennedy Brink, and I understand why she's a referee now. At the same time, don't piss off mom. But Yeah. I mean, this entire match does happen outside. I don't even remember hearing a damn bell. I actually really don't remember hearing a bell. The um, bell official, the bell was signaled for, but never actually rang once Soraya rolled into the ring after throwing Kennedy inside. Oh, okay. And then so, Soraya locked in the the rocking horse submission. Kennedy tapped out, and that was all the all that we do. Yeah. And you know what the weirdest part about this is? I mean, besides Soraya repeatedly kicking Kennedy south of the border? Sure, tell me. Soraya was cheered. That was not weird at all. Soraya is the biggest name on this show, with the possible exception of the shimmer taker, Nicole Matthews. Technically, she wasn't a name on the show, though. She was not advertised. Okay, but when she showed up and said that Kennedy was going to get it handed to her on the pre-show, she became a name on this show, and she was cheered excessively on the pre-show as well. I suppose, although essentially from there, Mum has always been cheered, but Mum's kind of starting to take a back seat at Shimmer. Not that I'm saying by any stretch of the imagination that Mum should be taking a back seat to anyone or anything. Please don't kill me, Soraya. 
I would just like to say on behalf of men everywhere, ow. Ow. Stop the clock. Not that it was... I mean, it was running, but it didn't have to for this match. Out of curiosity. Three minutes and 19 seconds. I'll put that one off to the side. And, and I do believe I said she kicked Kennedy south of the border in four different ways during the course of that three minutes and 19 seconds. To be fair, she kicked Kennedy south of the border four different times as well. So, you know. Well, you uh-huh. know. Ignoring that. Next one, match number 12. It took us a while, but that's our first reference tonight. And our last. Talk about your own show, kid. Put yourself over. (laughs) And if I hear a Tracy Sucks chant, everybody dies. Okay. On that note, our 12th match of the night is the winners of the yeah last chance rumble squaring off so it is Britt Baker the mayor of Britsburg versus the skilled Canadian death ninja artist number one Nicole Matthews oh and I forgot Shimmer Taker start the clock one of the best matches on the show, and look who's in it. Um, that finish though, that leaves a horrendous taste in your mouth. Yeah, what the hell was that finish? This was essentially more or less meant to be a feature match for Britt Baker. The problem is Nicole takes the offense most of the time, and then just decides to throw the match away. Like, literally just throws the match away. Well, she wanted to hear her tap was the reason. Okay. Now, granted, at the same time, the entire time... Okay, back to live point of view. The entire time that Nicole is beating down Brit after the quote-unquote bell... The entire crowd is wondering if the match is actually over because we didn't hear a bell. Yeah, whoever was in charge, whoever was in charge of ringing the bell on this show is fired. May actually have been fired. Well, my uh, my guess is it was that ring announcer that we saw. If I had to venture, no, definitely wasn't him. I think I know who it is, and it's nobody that anybody would know. Like, literally nobody that anyone would know. Oh. I was thinking maybe it was Marty DeRosa, but we'll talk more about him yeah. in a minute. Um, the match yeah. itself was okay. As you mentioned, this was more of like, uh, do you remember the old like Wrestling Challenge and uh, Superstars matches where they would have the two people in, but one of those two people was a JTTS? Yep. Yeah, Britt was basically JTTS for Nicole here. Just we just happened need another to, hashtag. She just happens to uh, she just happens to pick up a win through the reverse decision because it doesn't make any sense for Nicole Matthews to be in the main event. No, not at all. And that honestly, that was about the time that we started to think something was up. When all of a sudden they just when Nicole decides to legitimately just throw the match away and they give it to Britt, we started to think something was up. Um. So yeah, the, the, it was a feature match, but the person who was supposed to be featured wasn't featured. Well, Britt's actually kind of stuck around Shimmer since, hasn't she? Yep, yeah. uh, teaming with Chelsea Green mostly. Actually, in Rise as well. <sighs> okay, okay, but at the same time, though, this was an opportunity for Britt to make her name against one of the bigger-named people out of Shimmer there, and obviously it worked out for her if she's getting regular Shimmer bookings. Well, but at the same time, this was meant to be a single feature, and she's not being tag matches now. Hmm. 
So, eh? Meet in the middle? What, what was that? That was my phone. How dare your phone make ringtone noise? Anyway. <sighs> three minutes and 43 seconds. I don't think we've gone over officially at all. The only match that we actually went over on was Soraya and Kennedy, but that had more to do with the fact that it was all, almost all pre-bell than any of it was post-bell. I still think we could have pulled off the 19 seconds. Uh, Soraya mean kicks Kennedy low repeatedly. Stop the clock. Does that work? Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Tag match, right. player. Stop main event time. Mercifully. The Boohoo Death Squad, the Fallen Flower Kikio, and the Big Bang Ronnie Nicole versus Team Sea Stars, Ashley Vox and Delmi Exo with Jocelyn. Yes, pun intended. So Jaws. Okay, it's Jocelyn. J A Jocelyn. J A W S all in capital letters. O L Y N. For Christ's sake. I don't I don't come up with it. I just reported how I see it. Start the clock. Okay, Heenan. I am a broadcast journalist and the clock is running, so go ahead. That finish. <laughs> yeah. You kinda have to talk about it, don't you? Yeah, because it was one of the worst finishes of the weekend because we thought she actually got hurt. Ashley got hurt off of that? Well, frankly, that doesn't surprise me. I'll put it this way. That is the only time we have seen Ronnie Nicole at Shimmer. That might be the only time we will ever see Ronnie Nicole at Shimmer. She won both matches she wrestled that weekend. She used the same finisher. She hurt both opponents. Yeah, okay, so for those of you that aren't watching the show and you're just listening to our review for context, the finish is actually a variation of the bonsai drop. But the plan for it was, is instead of using the ropes to guide herself down, she just leaps off backwards blindly like a freaking dumbass. All right, I, there's no nicer way to put this. What the fuck was that? The match or that beeping? No, the finish. I know what the beeping was. The beeping was a notification on my tablet. I'm ignoring that. I'm using it for the, uh, I'm using it for the, the stopwatch. Yeah, that match was essentially half comedy match, half squash. Because the Sea Stars part, I've actually seen stuff from the Sea Stars, mostly because of their work in Chikara. Um, where they were actually featured, and I think got a mini documentary written about them uh, through, through Chikara. But yeah, these guys, these girls, forgive me, these girls actually aren't bad. It's just these are the wrong opponents for them here because TGO and especially Ronnie Nicole had no real interest in working with them. And the thing about it is TGO's not bad. I think, I think out of the, I'll say four in the match, the outlier here was Ronnie Nicole, but at the same time, the person with the most experience here was Ronnie Nicole, because she actually works in Japan. This was her first American show in a long time, because she's been working, uh, I want to say Pro Wrestling Diana in Japan. Um, well, so frankly, she, she's she actually has the most experience. Which is kind of the scary part about it. You don't want yeah. to do us all a favor and do your opponents a favor and keep that crap in Japan. Yeah. If you're going to work this way, if you're going to hurt people by working sloppy, you can keep your ass in Japan next time. And the rest of you. Hell, take Sexy Star with you. Wait, take okay, maybe, not, maybe that was a little too harsh. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. No comment. 
I, I stated yeah. my piece on Sexy Star when we did our last show. I don't think any, uh, I know. I, not, as soon as I said it, I realized I messed up. Anyway. Um, but, yeah, it's just not a good finish, especially the finish. And, like I said, I don't know that we'll see Ronnie Nicole in the Berwyn Eagles Club again. I'm good. Yeah, I got nothing to add other than let's keep Ronnie Nicole away because yeah, you got to be you got to be more professional than that. You cannot be thrown, especially when you outweigh a girl by as much as she outweighed Ashley walks by. I would say she's easily, and I don't think I'm making this up. I would say she's easily about a hundred pounds heavier than Ashley is. I wouldn't be surprised. And you've literally sat on this girl full of force with nothing to protect yourself with. At least when Yokozuna did the bonsai drop, he landed on his feet first. Keep it professional, Lonnie. Get rid of that move from your arsenal. You're going to keep hurting people with it. Stop the clock. 427. Longest so far of the night. All righty, so we definitely have some free time here in terms of catching up. Not that we'll need it. So, our next contest, the main mercifully, event. mercifully, match number 14 of 14 for the night. It's at this point that Delilah Doom, Angel Dust, Britt Baker, and Kate Carney come back out, to which we are then all greeted with free snacks, no, I'm not kidding, from Rise owner Kevin Harvey. It was a ploy. Why? Because he needed an excuse to bring the bag out. Not a bad one, because it kind of, you know, I didn't think it was that bad of an idea to bring, Did you to bring have like, the extra goodies out. No, I didn't catch anything. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. I mean, there were only 90 people in attendance. Your odds were like one out of six. He didn't throw that much stuff. He threw like three bags of chips and two cans of Coke and, a, and two shirts. Yeah, which means 90 divided by seven. Okay, so like one out of nine. That's 63. Regardless, moving on. The main event for the evening is a four-way one fall to a finish match between Delilah Doom, Britt Baker, Angel Dust, and Kate Carney. And it is for the hashtag FB0R, the first Phoenix of Rise. It is to crown the first ever Phoenix of Rise champion. Shall we start? Start the clock. Not ready. Hold on. Okay. Clock started. Go ahead. All right. This was, and I know you're going to talk about this, this was brutally short. This was under five minutes. And it was essentially a bit of a cluster. Now, at the same time, the argument could be made. This was Angel Dust, Kate Carney, and Twilight Dean's second match of the night, and it was Britt Baker's third. So I can kind of understand with it being short, but at the same time, if you're crowning a first-ever champion, you don't go under five minutes. That is too short, especially with the fact that not much really happened. Most of it was brawling outside. Um, I didn't mind, as a matter of fact, I liked the finish of it. I thought Angel Dust did a pretty damn good uh, uh, backstabber from the second, well, with with her opponent hanging off of the second rope, I guess would be the best way to put it, uh, to become the first Phoenix of Rise champion. So I was okay with that, but give us a little more. Oh, boy. You got out of the first Angel Dust match. You can't get out of this one. No, I know because this is the um, this is the main event and it's for the title. So I guess I kind of um, first of all, you verbatim stole what I was going to say about the length of this contest. Frankly, I understand it's the third match on the show, but if that's going to be the case, if you're going to have a title match 
and then you're going to have qualifiers throughout the show, make the qualifiers earlier in the show. And then give them a series of matches that they can use to get themselves ready to go backstage, that they would be getting very stretched out in order to get ready to get over up, in order to get the match all set up and figure out what they're going to do and stuff like that. All well and good. You do not crown your first champion in a match that goes less than five minutes. A joke to the title. And then it's an even bigger screw you to the Rise people that were in attendance. The first title change for Rise happens outside of the, the uh, arena. Well, not even at the next Rise event either. It happens in yeah. AIW. Yeah, I don't think the issue is the fact that it happened out of the Berwyn Eagles Club because it's the company. Company holds shows. Well, actually, now legitimately all over the world. They've done Berwyn. They've done uh, a double shot with AWS down in California. They are, I believe, as of recording, less than two weeks away, maybe a week and a half away from doing a show in England. You know, with Bellatrix Female Warriors, which is Saray and Knight's company. So, being outside of the Eagles Club, okay. Being outside of Rise, that's a problem. It's literally your first title change, and you couldn't even do it at your second show. You had to do it before that. Even the UK, even the WWE UK Championship is held a little longer. Uh, yeah, it it, it, it it bothers me that they're going to do this to the people in attendance that paid in order to see the show, and then you're going to take the t- first title match, the first title defense, or the second title, de- no, the first title defense for Angel Dust and have it outside of the company and have her lose the title, especially after the impassioned promo at the end of the show that Angel Dust cuts as well. Now, I get that it's kind of an end to a mean situation in order to get Angel Dust aligned with Rosemary going forward, spoiler alert in order to get Shotzi aligned with whomever Shotzi ended up bringing, and I do not remember who it was. I want to say it was Saraya. Didn't. So. Didn't. No one. Well, I thought there was a tag match on, like, uh, on like Rise number three or something, where she... No, nope. Shotzi. Was that the dog caller? Yep. Oh, all right. Well, anyways, all the same. Um, just the fact of the matter is, it's like, like Patrick said, you're going to crown your first ever champion. You're going to go less than five minutes here. That being said, in the four uh, qualifying matches, these are the four women that impressed me most in their qualifying matches. I, I thought Samantha Heights was okay in her match with Delilah Doom, but I definitely thought Delilah Doom's personality carried that match. Obviously, Angel Dust was a superior worker to Aria Blake, even though Aria was not bad. And they recovered nicely from a blown finish in that match, I thought or from a blown sub finish when they went for the X-Factor out of the turnbuckle and it didn't connect. So then they did, they had the X-Factor in the center of the ring for the near fall instead. I thought that was wise not to try to capitalize on the uh, yeah. in order to keep moving forward after the uh, the corner issue there. I mean, shit, stuff happens, you know? Just ask Tess Valentine. Huh? Just ask Tess Valentine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, stuff happens, you know. Kate Carney impressed me more than Heather Monroe. We really couldn't even discuss Heather Monroe because she didn't leave enough of a lasting impression on either of us to say much about her performance in the match. And then Britt Baker, while she was more or less Nicole Matthews' punching dummy for the vast majority of that match there, she showed resiliency. And I think that was the word that Kevin, uh, Kevin Harvey used to describe her as well when he talked about all four women before the contest was resilient. All right, hang on. Since somehow I know neither of us have managed, have managed to do it, I got to do it at least once before we actually wrap up the formal review. All right, Britt Baker, baby. I'm good. Okay, then I caught like bits and pieces of that because my phone cut out, but I'm sure our listeners heard it. Next. I just said Britt Baker, baby. Oh, Jesus. No, 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 no. That's Seth Rollins.
the match itself is relatively action-packed. The four women do keep a pretty frantic pace for the five minutes that it does go, but I would strongly disagree with the fact that the title game only went five, or the title match went only five minutes. You don't got started. I don't blame you. I'm good. We done? We're done. 14 matches down. 6.58, but that's not really a surprise. When we spend uh, longer talking, when we spend longer talking about it than the title match actually goes, it's a problem. Especially when it's the main event. Yeah. Not to mention we cut other ones so short that I think we'd be allowed to go long on one. All righty. So that was. Rise one ignite. Yeah. Yes, it was. Oh, we're not done yet, Patrick. Oh, I know. I know, but I'm saying, yeah, that that was a thing. All right. Big finish time. It would certainly appear that way. Indeed, as always, the best and the worst matches of the show and the cash and the trash. Oh, this ought to be good. Only because I really want to hear this one. What's your best match of this show? Um, I'm going to go with Savannah Evans and Shotzi Blackheart. Damn it. I, I was, Here we are. I was really entertained by the match. I thought that Shotzi was a nice surprise because I had seen the hype about her, and I was curious as to whether or not she lived up to it. She portrays her gimmick really well. She's very spunky inside of the ring, which I think is necessary in order to do this. And I think that she is somebody who, if she keeps her head on straight and is able to continue developing at the pace with which she is currently developing on, she is somebody that can make big waves in the women's wrestling. How about you, Patrick? What's your best match? Uh... It has to be the six-woman tag, obviously. God, no. Um, actually, I'm just I'm going to go with the match that was one, one match later, Kennedy Ring versus Serena Knight. Why? These were a lot of it-was-what-it-was it was matches, but at least this one kind of paid off a little bit. Granted, at the same time, it started and ended a one-night storyline, but at least it paid off. Um, and I mean, it was at least a decent brawl, even though it was literally just around the ring and Kennedy was more or less mom's tackling dummy, but it still wasn't that bad. And yes, I'm including everything outside of the brawl, or rather outside of the bell as well. Um, mom's, mom's submission to me still hurts. It looks like it legitimately hurts. It looks like a legitimate submission. So I, I've got no real gripes about it. Oh, no, I have no real issues with the submission as well. Plus, you had the fact that Kennedy had a hard time getting into the ring by herself so that, to the point that Soraya finally just threw her in the ring and put her inside of the rocking horse. So I'm curious as to whether or not Kennedy may have suffered an actual injury on the floor, and that's why they went straight to the finish. Not that I was sure about that, actually. All righty. This should be good. Harry? It depends what on your you? definition of good. Oh, good as in intriguing. Harry? What's Please. your worst match of this show? Um. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, is there's so much to choose from. And that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. It shouldn't be like this. So it's the reverse DDP. Yeah, not a good exactly. thing. It's a bad thing. And now you hate you because of you, not because of me. Anyway, um, I'm going with the Battle Royal. <laughs> far too many dead out. spots. Far too many dead spots. Far too many people just standing around, hanging over by the ropes. And then you had numbers one and two pretty much dominate the entire match because... Why? Well, reasons, I guess. I don't know. It just it just happens that way. And uh, I will admit that I was impressed by a couple of the girls in this match. I thought that Jocelyn was actually a decent worker. I thought that 
I was really impressed by the role of Dobry Girl, Lane Rosario as well. But more or less, the entirety of the participants in this match did absolutely nothing for me between Bay Jackson, MJ Jenkins, um, Paloma Stard really didn't do anything for me. Kira Hogan. Kira Hogan, actually, I was kind of impressed by, but she wasn't in the match long enough to really leave much of an impression, though. And Kira I've got is a actually story about her for off air. <laughs> Kira is actually doing much better now. If I'm not mistaken, isn't Kira signed to a developmental deal now? I think she's the WSU Spirit Champion. Wait, what? She's the WSU Spirit Champion, if I'm not mistaken. I'm off, if I'm not mistaken, she also just recently signed a developmental deal with NXT as well, or she was offered one recently. I don't... Are you thinking of Kira Hogan, or are you thinking of Ariel Monroe? I, I still think it was... Uh, I still think Kira was recently offered a deal as well. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But I, I could have sworn I remember reading that Kira was off. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. All right. Well, anyway, but I back, could be wrong. So back to the uh, back to the match at hand here. Yeah, there was just nothing about that battle royal that stood out to me, and the fact that they had the, through the rope elimination rules as well just made it seem even that much more ridiculous. And don't you dare call me a cop-out for picking that, because you know darn well you were about to as well. Actually, no, I wasn't. I legitimately was not. Okay, well, you're wrong. Uh, no, I'm not. Six-woman tag. Legitimately, the six-woman tag. Um, everything about it was ridiculous from the changing tag partners because they like to dance to the fact that the match sucked to the fact that, to me, one of the worst wrestlers on the entire card was in it. And I mean that. Um, you need to drop names here because no. you, you've you t- tiptoed around that twice now without saying a name. So drop the name already. Nope. Freaking crap, man. I work with one of the women on this show on a regular basis, and I talked about her match. <laughs> All right, you're right. It's the same person you gave the trophy to. The yeah. Exact same person. The exact same person. Yeah, Stacey Shadow. Good God. Just nothing. I've, I've never seen a single good thing about her in any match I've watched of her. Ever. Um, just, ugh. And then just the fact that the whole match itself was just goofy and ended up ruining the names of their teams. Just nothing about it was good to me. All right. So we started off good. I think we sandwiched it with good. So in this case, what's your trash for this? My trash and my cash kind of go hand in hand. Damn it. And I think you know where I'm going with this. I may be along the same lines. Literally along the same lines. Uh, my, my cash, so I'm going to give them both because they're actually along the same line. My cash for this show was Veda Scott. Veda went above and beyond to put over all of the talent on the show, talking about her experiences with some of the girls, talking about the gimmicks for some of the girls giving examples of their experience levels and the fact that they all came out to this seminar slash show in order to better themselves by having the opportunity to work with somebody like Saray and Knight. Veda was on point on commentary. And I've heard Veda do commentary before. This is the first time I've ever heard her do commentary as Veda Scott the person rather than Veda Scott the character, if that makes sense. Because most of the commentary yeah. that I've heard most of the commentary that I've heard from her has been as Veda Scott the character in AIW Absolute Intense Wrestling. Airy, most people know what AIW is. You don't have to always say the name. Well, whatever. I'm just saying. Marty DeRosa was awful. He literally seemed like he wanted to be anywhere else but here. 
most of his comments were uninspired. Most of his statements were uninspired. His, his delivery was monotone. He barely showed any kind of inflection in his voice. He didn't really take the time to put anybody over. I was thoroughly disappointed because I've actually heard DeRosa do commentary before, and he's not bad when he's interested. He clearly was not interested. Which is weird because off air, I guess, you know, outside of the show on that night, he seemed ready to go. Like, he, he looked like he wanted to be there. So I don't know what happened when that mic turned on. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but this is the absolute worst I've ever heard DeRosa sound on commentary. How about you, Patrick? Put your trash first and then your cash. Um, oh, you're going to hate me for this one. You're really going to hate me for this one. My trash, everything. My cash, they learned from their mistakes. And I mean almost everything. The fact that they ran the show on a Thursday was a mistake. I really didn't like the commentary. I thought Veda Scott sounded... I don't want to say stupid, but she she was what sounded disinterested to me. And Marty DeRosa wasn't much better to me. Another mistake. The ring announcer was a mistake. And 14 damn matches on one card that's under three hours was probably the most egregious error, especially when you had... had technically five people work twice and one person work three times and you still had 42 other wrestlers to get through. Ron and Cole should not have wrestled at all, especially with the fact that, you know, she damn near crushed Ashley Fox. Way too much reliance on the hashtags. Hashtag you've got two. Hashtag FP0R. The fact that it was zero and not O. I guess he didn't want to make it too obvious. The belt's nice. I'll give him that. And also what we talked about earlier, the fact that the first title change happened not at a Rise show. There are so ungodly many mistakes. That goes along with my cash that they learned from them. By the time we got to Rise 3, which was this past July at the Eagles Club, we were down to only 10 matches. There was somewhat of a set roster, and the ring announcing didn't get any better. But it's not this guy. So I'll leave it at that. Um, You know, for his... For as relatively disappointed as I was in the ring announcer, honestly, he wasn't my biggest complaint about commentary or anything related to commentary on the show, so I'm kind of willing to give the guy a pass, frankly. It was literally his first show ever, so I'll give him a pass. And I would assume one of his only ones ever, but I think it is. But they were at least able to go from here and actually learn from their mistakes. Much like what happened uh, when we reviewed the first and the second uh, Wrestling Revolver show. And we saw that, I don't know about you, but to me the second one looked better than the first. By the time we got to the third, they didn't run the show on, by the time we got to Rise 3, they didn't run the show on Thursday. They didn't overload the card. So they learned from a lot of their mistakes. So that proves that Kevin, Kevin Harvey, the owner of the company, is, you know, always wanting to improve. And hopefully, you know, as we get to Rise 4 in England and Rise 5, which will be back here in Chicago, hopefully things will just get better. Uh, I am incorrect. I am incorrect, by the way. What else is new? I mean, how? Angel Dust's first title defense actually was in Rise, at Rise to Ascent. She defeated Delilah Doom. The loss to Shotzi Blackheart for the title happened after Rise. Because Rise number one, Rise number two was in January of 2017. I want to say she dropped the belt to Shotzi at AIW in March. Give or take. Yeah. Because I think... 
I think Angel Dust would end up getting the rematch in Chicago. I think it was a three-way. Like, it was Veda, Shotzi, and Angel Dust, and I think that was Shotzi's first title defense. Well, she's showing up. Shotzi's showing up everywhere in 2017. I'm on, uh, I'm on cagematch.net, and the list of promotions worked for this year for her is insane. I'm not surprised. This girl's blowing up, man. Speaking of blowing up, well, okay, no. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with it, actually. I don't know what I was thinking there. Before we get out of here, what is your final score for Rise 1 at night? And please, please, don't hold back. I want it to be a lot nicer to this show. I, I, I wanted to have my expectations high for this show. I wanted to I wanted to be impressed by this show. I, I, I wasn't. From the vast majority of the cards either the vast majority of the matches either under delivering or living up to expectations, which is not a good thing. To the various reasons of the way people were used for their matches or what have you to the booking in regards to the way some of these matches go, such as the main event only lasting less than five minutes, to just the sheer stupidity in the amount of matches on this show in the first place. I'm giving Rise 1 a 4. This is a below-average show. There are signs of potential here. There are people with potential here. Angel Dust. And I'm not just saying that because I work with her. Angel Dust is one of the most underrated talents in women's wrestling right now, and I will stand by that, regardless of the fact of us working together or not. Shotzi Blackheart, definitely impressed. Britt Baker, definitely impressed. Delilah Doom, impressed. Kate Carney was entertaining, I thought, and I made the Trish Stratus comment earlier, and I felt like she kind of walked that line as a, woman, as a beautiful woman who's not afraid to show a devious side. But the, the, good, the bad just outweighs the good on this particular show, and I don't think anybody will deny that. You are being a lot nicer than me. I went into this knowing that this could get me into a lot of trouble. And here's where it probably would. I won't say Spring Stampede 2000, though, which I believe I wanted to give a zero. And I think I ended up at two. You did give it a two, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, even though, like I said, I know I wanted to give it a zero. Um, for me, Nicole Savoy and Mercedes Martinez were promoted for the show, and they were out there for two and a half minutes. There was way too many matches that are way too short to where the matches they could have some appreciation for go underappreciated because you're trying to get through all of that in three hours, technically. Doing this on a Thursday was a mistake. We didn't realize it at the time, but we do now. And, and I say we as not only you know, the, the crew and the wrestlers and everything, but even as the fans. Once we, the fans, started walking in and realized, oh, there's not a lot of us showing up, we realized there was a problem. The over-reliance of hashtags, and seriously, I dare anybody to go back and, and pay attention to that because I want to say there's at least four or five hashtags with the show. Almost hashtag, hashtag. Shut up. Outside of the fact that even the poster's wrong on the front of the case. <clears throat> or at least not updated properly. I'll explain off air. Um, there's not a lot that goes right here. But as Harry said, there's room for improvement in the future. And, you know, I'd be willing to go back and go to two or three 
or four or five whenever they happen, you know, and review just to see how have things gone along. But for now, 2.5. This is not a good show. I wouldn't even say this is good for a first show. So, 2.5. Here's my question, Patrick. Are we willing to give Rise 2 a chance to improve much the same way we did with our, de- with our debut review of the Wrestling Revolver? I would say yes, but not right away. Well, no. We waited a couple of months in between doing uh, Iowa Goes Lucha and the debut show for Wrestling Revolver. Yes. So I mean, so I would say maybe around the time of Rise Four, aka Shimmer Weekend in November. Sure, maybe we can re-explore that option. All right, that's that works for me. I'm okay with that. I'm down. I just I figure in order to give them the chance to see the opportunity if they can grow and stuff because I looked at the card for Rise Number Two, and the card for Rise Number Two looks significantly better on paper. And you mentioned that uh, there are 10 matches on that second Rise card. However, three of them are very, very quick. And two of, them well, involve the, two of them involve the same person in what are essentially squashes. Well, if also, if I'm not mistaken, the 10-match card idea didn't start until three. The formal 10-match card idea. Two just happened to have ten matches. And then Kevin came out with the announcement and said, starting at Rise 3, we're going to go with only ten match cards. So, so I, sh- I say if you're, if you're a fan of the promotion, if you're listening to this episode, if you're a fan of the promotion, give us another listen when we do Rise number two and see if we think that the company has improved any. I mean, there are a couple of matches I see on the Rise 2 card that look interesting to me that I can't lie, I'm actually looking forward to seeing. But we'll see if they, if they can live up to my expectations. Including one of your favorite wrestlers making her in-ring debut for Rise on the second show. Can't tell if you're being sarcastic or not. I'm not. I'm referring to Mercedes Martinez. Oh, Okay. Is there somebody else that I think wrestles on that that some people like to claim is my favorite wrestler? Um, yeah, I don't have the list in front of me anymore. I just know that Mercedes wrestles Shotzi on the second show, and it's a match that I'm kind of interested in. And remember, folks, if you want to get very angry and right now, at me for my review of Rise 1, 2, 9, be sure to send those emails to s.garber at gmail.com. <laughs> All right, ready to do some plugs and get out of here, Patrick? Yes. And, well, if you're listening to this, then hopefully by this point you're actually able to hear the two previous episodes that I, as of recording, haven't yet gotten onto the website. Sorry, Sean. Sorry, Paul. Sorry, Harry. I've been a little busy. That will be fixed tomorrow, Labor Day. But if you are hearing this, then be sure to check out all of our previous episodes, including all of our August 1998 pay-per-view reviews, including ECW, Heatwave 98, WCW, Wild 1998, and the Highway to L, SummerSlam 1998, at W2Mnet.com, as well as our written reviews, which you, as of now, can check out. PWG, Three Madness, the third anniversary show, our review that goes alongside our audio review of that. As always, you can also hear me on LastRoundSports.com and 411Mania.com. Um, also, if they are interested in hearing new material from us from last week, in addition to checking out the ending reviews of August 1998, they can check out myself you and Wrestling to the Max's Paul Weezer as we do the first four episodes of the May Young Classic available on W2Mnet.com in the 
in the wrestling section as well as wherever you listen to your podcasts, including Stitcher, iTunes, um, you know, what have you there. And Blog Talk Radio. Yes. Reunited and never mind. Um in addition um, if you want to look better stop. You better stop with that one. In addition And Harry just cut off, so since he's not here anymore, I'll get his plug out real quick. You can hear him every Monday night doing the Raw Reaction over on YesWrestling.com. So, because I know that's what he was good. Oh, hi, Harry. I just got your plug out of the way. Don't worry. Yeah, that's what happens when you have a new phone and sometimes you hit buttons you shouldn't. Because you were about to plug the raw reaction, weren't you? No, I wasn't, actually. If you want to listen to more of me on the W2M network, and frankly, after my performance tonight, I'm not sure that you would, but if you'd like to, I am the new current regular co-host for the SmackDown Live and 205 Live reviews with Sean Garmer. This particular week, however, I will be joined by Paul Leeser for those reviews due to the fact that Sean has a prior commitment with Football to the Max. In addition, if you are a football fan, you can check out myself, Stephen Err, and Brandon Biscobing as we present the kickoff on the W2M network as well. I think that's everything. Oh, oh and yeah, Monday nights, 11.30 p.m., Raw Reaction, Blog Talk Radio. And just for the hell of it, since we're plugging everything, be sure to listen to Kevin Gray and myself as we do going Broadway every Wednesday night at 8.15 Central Ish. over on WLGKRadio.com. I think we're done. For our producer, Sean Garmer, I'm Harry Broadhurst. And I'm Patrick Katza. Thank you guys once again for joining us as Wrestling Unwrapped reviews Rise 1 a night here on the W2M Network. Night, everyone. The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment.